Hello there, everyone. Welcome to a Second Thoughts overview of Heinrich Kemmler of the Vampire Counts. I played the initial turns, getting a feel for how the faction plays out. These are my conclusions, and in the end I showcased the army compositions that I would try out for fun. This is not an in-depth guide, but it has all that you need to engage in this campaign. Let's play then with Heinrich Kemmler of the Barrow Legion. So, for our short victory condition, we need to destroy the faction of Arguilon. We also need to maintain control of Baston, the Forest of Chalon, and Carcassonne. Basically, some of the, the uh, provinces here from Bretonia should be easy. And then we need to, of course, occupy Loot Razor Sack 30 different settlements. Now, it's a very straightforward campaign. It should be completed fast without too many issues. Uh, gladly, you don't have to actually own anything in Arthaloran, but you do need to destroy a faction there. Now, the reward is casual replenishment rate plus 15% to all armies. This is great to ensure your armies, of course, are fully replenished to continue your conquests faster, or, of course, to overcome any climate difficulties. Now, for the long victory campaign, it changes. Uh, you need to achieve the short victory conditions, occupy loot, raise a sec 75 different settlements, and then to control everything from the Empire, really. Basically, all this massive area around here, that's what you need to own. You also need to destroy the faction of Reichland, so Altdorf here needs to be conquered. Uh, achieving this, you gain Winds of Magic. I do not need to remind you how excellent this is for the Vampire accounts and their great spells, so yeah. It's a re really good buff. Now, uh, basically for the long campaign, it's a much better position here for Kembler to achieve this long campaign. Uh, and it should be done accordingly, while giving you enough room, of course, to pursue other domination or other scenarios, if you prefer. Now, uh, the Kembler is the Lich Master, so he enjoys with diplomatic relations with Warriors of Chaos, Demons of Chaos, Beastmen, and Norska. This is excellent, uh, especially to ensure that nothing from the the top, <laughs> from the north, comes to to uh, to fight you. Basically, so you'll have a little bit of a border there and some good friends. You also have experience gained plus twenty five percent for Necromancer heroes. Also great. Necromancer heroes are typically very cheap to to obtain. You know, it's very easy to obtain them and they're always useful in any army and by all means they are they have great spells that will assist the army so all your armies should have at least one that's basically one good way of ensuring that they always have great spells there now you're also immune to chaos undivided corruption and chaos wastes attrition which is excellent given the first buff and the raise the dead cost costs minus 10 percent this is also really good considering that most of your army will be raised the dead uh, ra risen by the dead of course so yeah that's overall in the whole of uh, the whole the campaign you will benefit a lot from this uh, this uh, this cost now in terms of climates there's a, a, a nice change which is that mountain is actually suitable so let me show you here the climate suitability it's much better actually just the northern areas maybe uh, these unpleasant areas here around lustria but overall you have all of the old world to dominate pretty much a, a very lengthy domination campaign just going all around uh, the, the old world into the east, into Cathay area, and ignoring a little bit of the of the chaos wastes, depending of course on the campaign after that. But a really good uh, change of pace from Manfred and allowing you a good domination campaign. As always, here are the climates, of course. Basically, you should be wary of the casualty replenishment rate, but nothing too shabby. So, uh, because you do have some bonuses on that, especially after the short victory, who knows? This is a much better campaign, actually, for domination. So your starting province is a three settlement province, but quite difficult to defend, especially because you're divided here by this this fort and the mountains. So if you wish to Grungzint, you're going to have to work for it. Precisely another problem is how undefended it is. Basically, you'll always need a couple of armies to defend it should you go for it. So perhaps the best way is to ignore at least the completion of this first one uh, for a while until you can get a, little, a better foothold uh, in other places. Now, in in addition, you're surrounded by potential enemies. So the Dwarfs, the Empire, Britonia, all of them will 
certainly become your enemies very soon, and also the Wood Elves, so be wary. Your closest allies, the, you know, the, the factions that you can become allies with, like Festus, for instance, or even Bellacor, they will take time to reach you, so for the time being, you'll have to do without them. Now, a typical expansion is, of course, to try and control most of Bretonia and maybe to start expanding into the Empire lands while defeating also some of the Ethel Loran. If you have a chance, just destroy Ethel Loran, but of course, be wary of doing that too soon, as the attrition there is always a problem and always a difficult task. Now, later, of course, you should aim to control all of the Empire, and then who knows? Go further into the east, go into the south, it's up to you. But of course, by then, you'll be into the domination side of the campaign. Be wary, of course, of counterattacks from the High Elves, if you do manage to control most of the ports in Britonia. In terms of diplomacy, you're part of the evil tide, and you do have good relations with chaos and demons and everything, so your best bet for friends early actually are the beastmen. Norska, Feasters, over the years. So, uh, the, of course, your vampire accounts, friends will also be a, a, a bit of help, but they're either they're small or they're located pretty far away, so you'll have to do uh, with by yourself during the beginning, of course. Now, the outpost potential, of course, is mainly with those factions. So try to secure some of their missile forces, if possible. It is not going to be easy, maybe with Norska, of course, and the Chaos Warriors. Uh, but still, enemies will come from everyone that is the Order Tide, and uh, who knows, you might be uh, requiring some of these missile troops, even if it's just for the early game. In terms of mechanics, uh, they have just a few, but they're very interesting. So, raise the dead is your top means, actually, of recruitment. You fight battles, you stand on top of the battlefield and watch them raise. In anywhere, you can always get a few units, you know, and they'll have a chance, like like this there, to become available to, for recruitment next turn as well. So, this is always replenishing until that top number, and you can be changed via uh, research, for instance, and other stuff. Now, uh, Basically, for instance, oh, with the advantage is that you can recruit it in instantly and use it immediately. So you can surprise some enemies immediately by just instantly raising some chaff units or some good units and going against them, of course. Now, Blood Kisses. These are about getting the Bloodline Lords. Now, you gain them by assassinating characters or by faction leaders killed in battle or factions vassalized. So... Pay attention to that. Once you obtain those, of course, you can spend them on the bloodlines. These are a series of buffs, really, you know, that you can get. And uh, in essence, all of these buffs will be uh, available to you later on, as soon as you've awoken those. And with each buff, you also awaken one specific lord from that bloodline. Each of these these bloodlines will have specific legendary lords, basically. Honest, honestly, a mid between legendary lord and basic lord. They're often better than just the basic ones that you get, so for the most part, you should be able to just use these lords instead of the generic ones. That's that's a, a bit of the idea that I had. I'll show you in the end some of the compositions and some of the specific lords that you have, so that you can, you know... You know be aware of what you can do about them. Now, you do require corruption in order to ensure that uh, select for corruption here to ensure that your armies don't have attrition. So, should you, you basically you should always be corrupting wherever you're going to attack. Perhaps you can lead with some heroes to gain some advantage in that regard. Finally, should you actually lose some uh, armies, uh, some uh, entire units in battle, the dead rise again can bring back units to life. Probably this is, won't happen here, but if I would lose some units, of course, they had a chance still of coming back to life. I mean, this allows you to have, uh, to avoid having to recruit more troops, so it's always this uh, idea of keep going, keep going, keep going with the vampire counts. In terms of your province idiots, you have a control and corruption one, you have an income from all buildings, a recruit rank and local recruitment capacity, and also a growth and construction costs. Uh, for the most part, I'll use the growth one because they do have an issue with growth for, the, for uh, a long time. And uh, yeah, 
that's the one that we'll probably be using. Maybe the controlling repair corruption if I run into any problems, or late game some income, of course. In terms of the uh, the army stances, channeling is the one that actually enables replenishment in foreign territory. It works kind of like the encamp one. You can do this by with 10% uh, move, so yeah, by all means, this should be used whenever applicable, just to ensure that you're replenishing. Now, raiding is the one that will give you immunity to attrition. You don't have an in-camp one, which is a bit of a problem. It does require 50% move range. Ambush, it's the basic, 25% move range, and Force March as well. The same thing, <laughs> nothing to see here. So, speaking of buildings, so Blackstone Post has a nice landmark building that gives you control, it unlocks the, the hero of uh, recruitment of a necromancer, Lord Recruit rank is nice, research rate is really good, Vampiric Corruption is awesome, and it also unlocks recruitment of the Mortis engine, and below here a Felbats and Skeleton Spearman, so that is always excellent. Now, you still have the uh, Iron Mine here, so, you know, recruiting Grave Guards and Black Knights and Blood Knights from this uh, settlement would be be always excellent from this province would always be excellent in terms of military buildings you have seven of which only two can be built in in a minor settlement uh, finally you do not longer require the armory for any specific uh, units other than just the the ones that <laughs> that it provides it's just a standard one uh, previously you needed the armory to recruit these units which finally it's not required now, tier 3 units are rather decent with the infantry units, of course, especially after they gain magical attacks. Uh, you gain Vargeists and some Morgulds, which is excellent, but it is the tier 4 with Vargulfs, with the Mortis engines, and later on the Blood Knights and the Terror Guides that will do your killing for you. Of course, with, the good thing is that you actually have most of your heroes on the tier 3, other than the uh, Vampires of Shadows and Death that you can recruit over over here on the vampire crypts so yeah plenty of good choices there now in terms of infrastructure we have a growth and hero recruitment capacity note that even though it is a growth building it's rather low it's a, it's a big of a problem for the uh, the vampire counts always now income generated and control and also vampiric corruption as you've noticed vampiric corruption is important so be wary uh, of any necessity maybe you can pop one of these buildings uh, in a province that is in the middle of everything and that will help you out this is also it's a defensive uh, one but it can also be considered as an infrastructure building as well especially the raise that cost there so you can imagine how cheap it is if you're in a province that has uh, a mark to raise the dead uh, by all means have one of these buildings just so that you can you know recruit more units there it's totally worth the price for a longer period of time now, in terms of research, let's speak of research. It has a, a, a really good, it's not very useful, it's mostly divided into bonuses for infantry, for monsters. In, in this case, these are more the ethereal ones, I'll show you in a moment. And these are the, f the other ones, basically. And then you have some for the cavalry units and more campaign stuff, like for the knights and chariots. Uh, with, uh, given how, uh, how, uh, Kembler actually gives buffs to the, the 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 ethereal units. This is a decent line that it would follow, you know, to give them the barrier hit points and battle healing cap for kin rates and hex rates. Uh, so be mindful of that. It may be one idea for you to to pursue as soon as possible because, of course, he does buff them up. As always, we have our legendary lord or specific lord skills over here. As you can see, we do have the caster line. Kamler here has access to the typical vampiric line, so the lore of vampires is really good. Uh, you also have the red line or army skills and the blue line or campaign skills. Now, starting with the 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 Kamler, actually, he does have some nice skills for campaign and battle. Uh, the unique summoning of Krell is also excellent. He does buff up a lot can rates and hex rates, so we'll concentrate a little bit more on that later on, but also in unlocking some hero recruitment, uh, having some good campaign movement range, it's always excellent. In terms of the blue line, it does have replenishment right there, and the dead rise again, plus 15% hit points, it's always nice. And it has upkeep, as well as character experience gain, so 
I honestly don't ever go into this second line unless I want Uncanny Presence in Lightning Strike, for instance. But yeah, it's up to you guys. That means six skill points or maybe seven. So level seventh, I've completed the blue line and I'm ready for everything else, you know? So, of course, you may choose to go first into the, the red line. It's up to you. Speaking of which, it has good combinations. It is easy to synergize units, especially because it has mostly like the the bad units were and then the so the low tier units and the, the higher tier units on the same so that's always good when when this happens it's good to synergize with the bloodline lords i'll, I'll show you some uh, experiences later on some ideas later on now heroes are among the best in the game actually mostly because of their functions uh, you know for instance the white king and the banshee very good melee heroes banshee being ethereal you also have the necromancer which you can it does replenish troops and boost income and then the the uh, crazy good in battle they help you regenerate troops they have the lore of vampires so it's really cool uh, then we have the vampires which are a mix between caster and melee hero and they can get a flying mount as well so all of these are so good so good you'll never be wrong with having a couple of heroes there's even doom stacks with just heroes so yeah by all means you'll see them uh, and you will enjoy having a lot of heroes in your armies or available to you. That's also one good thing. They have a lot of possibilities to increase the hero level. And yeah, that will help a lot. So here are the red line skills for the vampire counts. They have a rather short roster and no missile units whatsoever. But it is worth noting that most of these are divided into categories. So if you like cavalry, for instance, you can just invest early on for the black knights and then upgrade them to black knights. That's basically it. If you like some creatures, you will have flying creatures as well in the conjunction with the monstrous infantry. So that's cool. And for infantry units, you have both the low tier and the higher tier here. So. Oh, excellent, excellent. That's why I love these ones, for instance. Now, let's speak of Kemler. Kemler gives regeneration for Cairn Wraiths and Hex Wraiths. You know, they need to be rank 7 and above. Be wary of that, okay? And he also gives them devastating flanker for these units and bonus versus infantry for both. So why not, you know, just a combination for fun with him? Nothing wrong with giving him some Grave Guards, by the way, or some you know, other units, some, some more blood knights, for instance. But let's keep it focused. Let's try to make it a full ethereal army right there, you know? That's the, at least the generalized idea that I would give. Maybe some heroes just to soak up the front, and that would be cool. Uh, be wary, of course, against magic-focused uh, armies, of course. Now, here we talk about the bloodlines. So in terms of the bloodlines, there's a few, for instance, like this one, that has the complete free fell bats and nearly free vargeists which is great you know i used these two combinations in my manfred campaign and this was an excellent combination to just assault sieges especially any almost anything because they, they would just demolish or it will be a good reinforcement army note how quick how, how simple it is in terms of redline skills which means that you will have the skills for anything else you know so that's always a good thing in terms of the the crypt horrors, of course, basically you can get some good bonuses for crypt ghouls and horrors, uh, some physical resist, some leadership over there, and of course they, they'll suffer from less upkeep. So why not? Why not some armies based on them? Again, notice how cheap they are in terms of redline skills. And once more, just some ethereal fun for you. You can always replace the Morngons perhaps with even some outpost units. That's what I did sometimes. So yeah, why not? Why not? Uh, and never go wrong with these combinations. So this is, like, let's say, the bread and butter uh, of the, the vampire counts. Just some standard, uh, now, grave guards. Grave guards are much better now with the magic damage. And blood knights. Uh, of course, you can vary the numbers. You can vary the number of heroes and different heroes. It's up to you. This is just a, a sort of explanation so that you can visually see, oh, okay, these units for those guys. You know, anything red for these guys, <laughs> basically. It's mostly I divide between having some some chariots, some mortis engines, or having some flyers, but it's up to you. This is a very versatile army, can defeat nearly anything in the battlefield. This one as well, but it's more difficult in sieges, that's why I gave them some more uh, infantry, but it's always up to you guys. Just have fun. Finally, 
a nice change of pace. And different enemies, certainly, with the Bretonians, lots of cavalry with Reichland nearby, with the Empire, with the Dwarves. So, yeah, a nice change of pace from Manfred. I like it. Kembler himself points into a whole different direction for his army, as you've seen. So that alone may prove interesting in the long run. Uh, basically, it may give you a nice challenge in the beginning, especially going against the Wood Elves, for instance, but nothing you can't take off, especially earlier on. Later, whatever happens with the Chaos factions in Norska is what will probably dictate your campaign, but nothing wrong with you going just east. Stay under line, just reach Cathay, and then go back and do anything else, you know? Your army consists of good infantry, great cavalry, great flying units, good chariots, no missile units whatsoever. Relies on magic earlier on. Be wary of that. Replenishment is good, but climate will be, of course, causing issues. Kembler suffers a bit less, however, so it is a nice faction to try domination with. Now, it is time to play with Heinrich Kembler.